I'm Dan Hunt, and this is Up Close and Personal. We are live at World CryptoCon 2018, and today I am interviewing David Johnson from Latium. Did I say it right? You said it correct. Latium. He's the CEO of Latium. But you know what, David? We're, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Okay. I really kind of want to talk about David. So, David, you grew up in Mississippi. That's correct. Yeah. What was it like as a kid growing up in Jackson? Did you grow up in Jackson? I know that's actually, where you live now. I actually grew up in, in Natchez. As, as a younger child, we moved, you know, preteens to Natchez. To Jackson. Yeah. One of those cities I've never heard of. Is it big, little? No, it's a little river city, you know? It's a little river city, probably like 60,000 people, something okay. like that, pretty small. Yeah. Okay. So talk to me about uh, growing up there. It, it, what was it like growing up in, in Mississippi? Well, I, I didn't know any uh, different, but I, I thought I had a great childhood. You know, I was surrounded by woods and land. You know, there were thousands of acres of woods and ravines and creeks to play in. So, I mean, I, I had thought I had a great childhood. Very, very nature oriented. Your, um, your parents made an interesting decision for you and your brothers and sisters. And there was six brothers and sisters? Yeah, I'm one of seven. You're yeah. one of seven? Yes. So you have six brothers and sisters and you, so yes. seven kids. And they made a very interesting decision that I think is more of a trend today than it was in the 80s. Yes. And that's being homeschooled. So you were homeschooled all the way through that time. Definitely. Tell me about what it was like to be homeschooled. Well, you know, it was, it was an inter again, it's one of those things when you're a kid, you don't know any different, right? That was my, that was my exposure in life. So, you know, I, I would say that I was somewhat uh, resentful of that as a teenager, you know, the not getting the high school dances, you know, right. I, I was having the typical high school pity party, you know, <laughs> um, but looking back on it, man, what a favor they did me, you know, by, by taking me out of the system because it just made me think differently. It made me analyze problems, not with any influence. I, I, I have, have that ability. I've always been able to cut through things. So it was, who it was an did, asset. Who <laughs> did that for you? Your, your mom? Did, I mean, did she have books that she worked she out did. of? Was there a set time frames that you guys did? When there, you were there was. There was there were set time frames and there was a curriculum. You know, it was an established curriculum. In fact, there was a curriculum that a lot of private schools used. Um, okay, so, so you actually had that same exact curriculum that everybody else had. Yes. What about friends? You know, as a, as a kid, you, you know, my friend, I look at my daughter now who's 20, her friends are more important than anything. Sure. So sure. talk to me about how did you get friends? Well, I, I, I really w didn't have friends probably up until maybe the age of, you know, six or seven. And then I started doing uh, outside events like Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, things like that. I acquired a, a group of friends um, as I was... As we moved to Jackson when I was 12 and I started playing soccer, I acquired a group of friends. They introduced me to their friends. They introduced me to their friends. A lot of those people I'm still best friends with today, you know, so. Do you think the experience of learning at home in a, in a tighter environment, mm -hmm. do you think that made you more introverted or more extroverted? I think it definitely made me more ex extroverted, without a question, because I had to compensate for not having this natural belonging, I guess, out, out there like everyone else did. You know, you go to school, you have this natural process that you go through with other people. Um, and since I was excluded from that, I had to kind of elevate that right. to compensate. Yeah. Now, your dad. Yes. Kind of a special guy. Very interesting guy. Very interesting very, guy. Yes, very interesting guy. He yeah. was a, a drummer for Fleetwood Mac when they were a club band. Well, he didn't play Fleetwood with Mac. Fleetwood. He played with Fleetwood Mac. They played in a band that would tour with them. That yeah, would tour he, with yeah, them. He, okay. yeah, he, yeah, he did play for Fleetwood okay. Mac. I don't want to get the wrong impression. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what was it like growing up with a dad that was a drummer on the road all the time? Well, the, that was this was pre me, right? So he was he was out doing that in the late '60s through the, the mid '70s. That was pre me. I think once uh, once they had children, he kind of had to settle down. I think, yeah. We talked a little bit about your hero as a young child. Yeah. You said it was your dad. Yes. Why? Um, well, it could have been because of the exposure that I had. Again, you know, because we were in a, it was a co somewhat confined environment. Right. Um, and it could have been just because I didn't, um, I didn't have that exposure to be able to see things outside of that environment. Now, later in life, you know, as I became a teenager and got into technology, I really started looking towards the, you know, the, the icons of tech. Right. Know. So let's talk about the icons of tech. Yes. Um, people like Steve Jobs, mm -hmm. 
Why? What, 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 what motivated you or what, what drew you to somebody like Steve Jobs? I just thought that he, the way he processes information made him different. The way he looks at a problem make, make, makes him different. He thought differently. So when they came out with a slogan, you know, think, think different. different. Yeah. I didn't think that that was Apple's slogan. I thought that that was Steve Jobs, you know. And, and have you maybe adopted some of that thought process as you've moved through your life and career? Oh, without question. Without question. I would say that I'm a, a massive contrarian uh, in general. Um, and I think that that, you know, has, has, has done well for me, you know. Now, you, you got a degree, so you, do you, you get a diploma from homeschool or do you test through? Is that how you graduate yeah. from high school? Back then it was a GED process. Nowadays it, there's diplomas. You right. Know? So. so so then you did a G so you went and tested. Yes. And that's the only education, formal education that you had up to that point, right? Yes. So you left at 17, 18 years old. Yep. You got your GED. Yep. What'd you do? Well, I started uh, uh, I just got odd jobs. I had I went out and decided I didn't want to live uh, in my parents' house, so I wanted to get my own place. So I got three full time jobs. Okay. And worked, you know, 120 hours a week, sometimes 110 hours a week. And I did that for about three months, and I got promoted at one job to the point where I didn't need the other jobs. And okay. so I was working as a cashier, working midnights, which was interesting. Um, within three months, I was running that convenience store. Uh, within nine months, I was running 12 convenience stores. And so that was my gateway into small box management. And now 15 years later, you have not one, not two. Yeah. Three companies? Yes. Yes. Well, actually, I have a few more, but there's three that I would say are my core. Yeah. Three, three are your core and <laughs> yes. just a couple on the side. Yes. Talk about overachievers. <laughs> <laughs> to go from that kind of a background to owning three companies, mm -hmm. to being a major sponsor of an event like this, mm -hmm. um, has to have something special in your mindset. What do you think it is about your mindset that has given you the success that you have today? Um, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm good at two things. I'm good at analyzing where something goes wrong in a business model and making it better. And I'm really good at finding the right people. And I think that's the key to success is surrounding yourself with good people. Okay. That, that, that is absolutely incredible. And you know, while we're talking about good people, you have a wife and how many kids do you have? I have six. You have six kids as well. I have six well. children, yes. So you have six children. Yes. <coughs> you met your wife as a teenager. Yes, yeah, we dated briefly. You dated briefly as a teenager. Yeah, pretty briefly, <laughs> I don't remember the exact timeline. It was pretty brief. <laughs> you left Mississippi. Yes. And you came back to Mississippi. Yes. Tell me about that time re-meeting your wife and, and starting your life as an adult. Well, at, at that point I was, you know, I was working way more than your average 24, 25 year old would because I was again in small, small box retail management. So, you know, a normal work week was 80, 85 hours, maybe 90, you right. know, on salary of course. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we, me, me and some friends wanted to go out for a Halloween party and um, went there. I had not seen my wife in probably almost a decade at this point. Almost. Right. Almost, almost 10 years. Yeah, almost. Um, and we were just hanging out at the party. I didn't even notice her and she just reaches out and grabs me. And she'll tell you that she didn't do that. Uh, <laughs> no, only she knows if that's true. Um, but uh, we've been together ever since. Been together ever since. Yes. Six wonderful kids. Yes. You've been back in Mississippi, you live in Jackson, Mississippi now? I, I, is that I, where your company's I, headquartered? I, I, yes, it is, yes. We're actually in Madison, Mississippi. In Madison, right? Mississippi, suburb, yeah. suburb of. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about Latium. What, what do you guys do? Well, we're a, a crypto platform to help adoption. We just want to make crypto easy. Um, we feel like it's way too complex for the everyday person. Okay, so you're making crypto easy for the everyday person or yes. for 
platforms and, and big companies? Well, we have a B2B model as well, but our goal is actually getting user adoption in the space because we don't feel like there's a lot of companies doing that. Right. Um, and we feel like that's what really makes the space grow. I mean, you can only do so much on B2B front without user participation. And how do you do that? Well, we, we, what we do is we've created what I, I like to call a door, right? We're a door that people can walk through easily. Within, they put in their email, they put in their password, they can come to the platform, they can work for crypto. Okay. So we're a tasking platform, they can exchange crypto, we're an exchange. Uh, we're a multi-currency wallet, and all this is done with convenience in mind. So they don't have to learn the technology, they don't have to learn how to store hashes. They can literally come in and within 10 minutes, they can go from not knowing anything about crypto to owning crypto. Is there a cost to your, your service no. or your platform? No, in fact, they're financially incentivized to do it because they can come in and trade their production for crypto instead of trading their, their, their cash. And where can people find out more about this? Do you have a website? No, or? definitely, definitely. We're, we're live, we're registering you know, between 1,000 and 3,000 users a day. It's latium.org. Latium.org, and that link is right below us here. Latium.org is the link. So you can click that link and get all the information about Latium.org. Now, is it an app as well, so it works it on is, the phone? It is, we have an Android app as well, yes. Okay, you have an Android app, but mm -hmm. you and I both like the app. You know, we like Steve Jobs, we're Apple people. What, what's going on here? Well, Do we have Steve Jobs is no longer with Apple, so um, <laughs> a Apple, Apple is not exactly the most friendly in the crypto space. So the, the approval process and bureaucracy with Apple is difficult. So at this point, we're trying to work with them to get through that process, but okay. they're a lot more uh, stringent than, than Google is. So. so it's coming. We've built it. They won't release it at this point, but we'll work through it. <laughs> I, I believe if you build it, they will come. <laughs> I'm a firm believer in that. So, you know, that, that app I'm sure will be out at, at some point yes. in, in the very near future. But for those of us that are Apple people, yeah. we could access it through a, a cloud service, through, through a computer. Oh yeah, well you can hit it on your phone. We have a decent web-based app right now. So, okay. you know, so it's, you it's web through. responsive, so it's, it's decent, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about World CryptoCon. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about, you know, you guys are a sponsor. Yes. Um, it's the first time out for World CryptoCon. What was your decision process to become a sponsor in this, what I consider an incredible event? Well, I, I uh, met Adam on the blockchain cruise, the CEO of World CryptoCon, and right. um, you know he was telling me about this event, and it just seemed like it was going to be different than any other event, and done at a level that no other event I've attended what would be done at. So I said, all right, we're going to participate in this, and I'm going to tell you, I've, I've been blown away. I mean, everybody I talk to, you know, most most of the people in the space, you see them over and over and over again at these conferences. Right. You know, uh, but this conference has been very different. It's been very different, and I mean that in the best way possible. So, let's talk a little bit about why you feel this is different. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I mean, you're saying the same thing that a lot of the other CEOs sure. are saying, that it's different, it's better, it's a, but that's not just smoke. Why do you think this is different? Well, I would say that one, one thing that I'm noticing about this conference is that there is, there is a consumer presence. One, right. Which is not typical. Okay? Right. Again, a, a lot of times we're an echo chamber as an industry, in my opinion. You know, we all talk about the things we want to do for each other, but nobody's saying, all right, let's talk to this other 99% that lives out there. So here we're seeing participation from that 99%. So that's one thing. Um, the organization has been great. The yes. events have been amazing. You know, it's just one great event after after another after another. Of course, the lineup is great as well. You know? Yes, you know the yeah. speakers are just world class speakers exactly. everywhere that that we go. Yep. Um, the booths, y y you know. Yes. It seems like the right amount of booths, everybody can get around. It, it's just been a really really great event. Yeah. So you will be a part of this event for World CryptoCon 2019. No question. I, I see that event. It's probably going to be twice to three times the size of this one. So, exactly. Yeah. I really believe this might be the crypto event yes. to come to in the future. I, I think so too. Well, David, thank you so much. I truly yeah. appreciate you being on Up Close and Personal. Best of luck with your platform. I know my wife and I are going to sign up for it right after this, even though I can't do it on my iPhone yet. <laughs> okay? If you build it, Don't they will me. come. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dan Hunt from the Aria Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada at World CryptoCon 2018 saying have a great rest of today and an even better day tomorrow.